Hi there, I'm Lena Anani, and you're listening to She Wrote a Book, where I interview amazing women from all over the world who also happen to be published authors. I created this show to educate, entertain, and inspire you to be the voice you want to hear in the world. Did you know this episode comes with a free gift? It's a webinar for aspiring authors who want to learn my insider secrets on writing and publishing books. You can access this free training instantly at shewroteabook.com slash bonus. Now let's get started. Great. You are listening to episode number seven of She Wrote a Book. And today I'm interviewing Manda Pepper Longline, author of the book, Sherlock Holmes and the Monumental Horror. This is one of the most recent additions to her Sherlock Holmes short story series. In this book, Sherlock Holmes and Watson travel to Paris to investigate the disappearance of a woman at a hotel. So Amanda Pepper Longline is best known for her Sherlock Holmes stories. She's also a produced playwright and screenwriter. Again, her book is called Sherlock Holmes and the Monumental Horror. You can find the link to purchase her book in our show notes for this episode at SheWroteABook.com slash the number seven. Amanda, it's such a pleasure having you as a guest today. I've got to ask, what what made you want to write and publish this book? Um... I actually got my start writing Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, I grew up reading Sherlock Holmes, watching the Jeremy Brett series on, you know, PBS. But um, what happened was I was, I was writing uh, stuff to get into grad school and I needed some, something literary to give them to show my writing. And I wrote the first story in the series, the mystery of the last line as my, as my entrance piece for Emerson college and it got me into grad school. And uh, years later, um, you know, it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, maybe once self-publishing became something people could do uh, relatively easily, I said, well, maybe I'll just throw this out there. And it, it actually did re- really pretty well. So after that, it was kind of like, oh, maybe I'll write another one. Maybe I'll write another one. And uh, so, yeah, so Monumental Horror was, was the most recent one. Um, That's awesome. What inspired, what inspired this one? Uh, you know, I, I had this image of this, uh, this statue, and I remember thinking, what if there was, and I mean, I don't want to give anything away, but I was like, what if there was a person inside that, like an actual person inside the statue? And that kind of was the jumping off point for the story. Oh, very cool. Okay. Um, so, so why, so, so what inspires you? Like, what's your creative process? How do you how do you sit down and decide to write fiction? Like, how I'm always I'm always admi- I always admire fiction writers. I'm a nonfiction writer, so like, whenever I, I talk to fiction writers, I'm like, how do you do it? It's incredible because there's just so many layers. There's so much character building that you have to do, and like, and then and then to have everything to flow and then come together at the end. I mean, I I think it's incredible. So how like what inspires you to write fiction? How do you do it? Well. It's funny because um, I always start with character, and the nice thing about writing Sherlock Holmes stories in the Doyle style, uh, which these are in, is that the characters are pretty well defined already. Um, People know them. I don't have to spend a ton of time investing it. I just need to be true to it. Um, But when I'm writing a story, this is kind of an odd habit I have. I lay down, I have a stuffed dog from FAO Schwartz called a Patrick puppy. (laughs) And I lay down with my dog and I daydream. (laughs) Until, like, I have this scene in my head just the way I want it, and then I go write it. And once I have that scene, I kind of build either from it or around it. Um, But there's almost always, like, a central scene in my mind when I start just from that daydream session, basically. And then um, as far as, like, plotting a a mystery, which is kind of a trick, uh, a lot of times – I find my subconscious does it for me. And I think it's because I grew up reading a lot of Agatha Christie and, and just, you know, and Sherlock Holmes, obviously I, uh, I kind of just go with it and then I start to see threads and I pull them together or I unstitch them if I need to go back and say, well, wait, this doesn't make sense. But, um, but I find if I don't think too hard about it, it actually works better than if I overthink it. I can see, I can definitely relate to that. Um, so, so how often do you cuddle with Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, right? Like, it's like my husband's really jealous of this dog. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, 
anytime I'm starting a story, anytime I'm stuck in a story, I go lay down with the dog. <laughs> I have a chaise in my home office by the window. Oh. I get a nice sun sunspot, and I uh, and I lay down, and I just kind of sometimes I'll put some music on. Cause sometimes like some, something that fits the mood to the to the story, and uh, and I'll just kind of be like put myself in the place. And coming from a screenwriting background too, you know, I visualize and I think about it literally how are they moving what's the what's the tension in this you know situation and i um and i just put myself in there and kind of watch it happen and see if it makes sense in my mind so 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 you go you go back and and daydream while you're writing each story so it's not just to come up with the premise for the story it's also while you're writing the story so if you get stuck you go back and yeah kind of reconnect yeah that's so cool how did you come up with that I mean I know writers have their I know a lot of writers have their habits how did you come up with this one you know I think it's just uh, from the time I was a kid I had a stuffed bear named William and I mean I've been writing for as long as I can remember since I was like, like eight or nine um, and I, I used to do that. I used to lay in bed with, with my bear and, and daydream up stories and then go write them. So I think it just ended up being something that worked for me. Um, and, and it stuck with me. Incredible. That's awesome. So, um, so you said you've been writing for as long as you can remember. What was, what would be the first piece of literary work that you created when you were a kid that you could remember? I have, um, this, this story from second grade, the teacher had given us like a, a picture and you were supposed to write a story about it. And the picture is of like somebody in a rocket ship. And uh, I wrote some story about flying to the moon and meeting a green tiger, but going home because I really hated it there. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, I really hated the moon. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I still have that somewhere. Um that's cool. Have you ever thought about turning that into like a children's book? <laughs> you know, and my kids are always like, "Mom, you should write us a book." I tell them fairy tales all the time. Um, but I, I don't know. I, the book I just finished is actually a YA novel, and uh, and that's about as, as down as I, I don't know if I could do children's. I've got a friend who writes picture books, and I don't know how she does it. I just, I, my brain doesn't work that way. I guess. Um, right. Too much detail, right? I mean, if you're yeah. writing fiction, yeah. long form, it, there's you need to come up with a lot of detail to to define the story. But when it comes to children's books, yeah, it's incredible. It's like, how do you tell a story in ten sentences? That's incredible. Uh, yeah, and people I, do it all the time, and I, they do it so well. It's amazing to me because yeah, I I get invested in the characters and the details, and you know, again, with the the screenwriting background and the visualization, I want to delve into like the psyche of people. I want to understand, you know, why they're behaving, why they, you know, what they're doing. I'm I, I minored in psychology, so you know that interests me, um, and uh, and so I'm like. Uh, you know, I read a children's book and I go, but where's the story? <laughs> you know, I, I I understand that this is a little girl and her, you know, bunny rabbit, but but where's the where's the passion? You know, I and I feel ridiculous, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, I where's just, the arc? Where's the story arc? <laughs> yeah, I, I I I I love depth, and I think you know that's just I like plumbing, plumbing the mm-hmm. the depths of character and and just situations um that are you know, that cause people to behave irregularly, you know, it's it's like, why are you the way you are? Um, my first Sherlock Holmes story was, you know, poked at his history, you know, he's so well known for being reticent and, and guarded. And, you know, they go back to his family home and Watson starts digging into Holmes's past. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that story did so well is that you know, it, people want to know these things about Sherlock Holmes. And um, and I, obviously it's anybody's guess what do, what kind of past Doyle would have given him. But, you know, uh, I gave him kind of these odd traumatic childhood thing. And, um, and people respond to that. They respond to drama. Very cool. Very cool. I think it's incredible what you're doing. Um, I, I love and I love that your process comes from wanting to know the the character's background, what makes them tick. I love that. Um, you also mentioned that you've got, you, you're about to release a young adult novel. What's that? Tell me a little bit more about that one. 
Well, that one, um, the young adult novel is uh, titled Changers, and I hope it's the first in a series. The subtitle is Manifesting Destiny. Um, I'm still shopping for a publisher for that one, but um, that one is actually, it's, it's about a girl who has a dragon living inside her, and she's trying to figure out how to tame literally her inner self. Um, and, uh, she's, she's in love with her best friend, but he's gay. So there's like complications there. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely different. Uh, but I wrote it for my daughter who's very into dragons and, <laughs> and, you know, um, and I, I don't know, it, it was, it was, it was fun to write. It was very different writing a YA fantasy from writing a Sherlock Holmes story or um, or like my novel that's coming out in January, which is a 1960s spy novel. Another gay character, my main character in that one is gay too. I don't know. Oh, cool. Um, I think I have a lot of gay friends and mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to be patronizing, but um, I feel like a lot of gay literature is all about being gay and I'm like, you know, their whole lives are not them being gay, they they have lives and they happen to be gay. And so my goal with with these stories and the the, the Peter novel um actually won an award, well the screen version won an award because they were like what we loved about it was he was gay but that wasn't the point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um we loved that he was gay and that was just who he was. And uh and so the Peter novel is all about him being a gay British spy and um and then his lover gets accused of you know being a, a counter agent and he's got to figure out if it's true or if he'd rather not know <laughs> the truth <laughs> you know he's like oh yeah but what's that what what was that book called again the fall and rise of peter stoller oh okay and that one's coming out in january 2016 yes yes it's okay. um it should be on pre-order uh probably by the holidays 2015 um and yeah, it'll be out from Tier Gear Publishing in Ireland. Uh, in twenty. Very cool. Very cool. So it sounds like you work with different publishers. Is that? Yeah, I do. Uh, the Sherlock Holmes stuff I self-published. I've kind of moved up the ladder, right? Like I self-published yeah. a couple things, um, and then Peter got picked up by Tier Gear, and I've ha- I have a couple of publishers interested in Changers now. Um, so you know, I would have changes to Tajir, but they don't do YA. So, um, cause I've loved working with them. They've been great, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, so I'm just, it, it, it is a lot of balls to juggle when you've got, I mean, you know, in some ways self-publishing is easier because the only person on the hook is you, you set your right. deadline, you decide when things are going to happen. But, um, I worked in publishing, I worked in textbook publishing for almost 10 years. And, um, as much as I trust myself as an editor and everything, because that's what I did, it's so good to work with a publisher and have other eyes on it and, you know, <laughs> know that, like, it's not just on you. Um, I have a great writing critique group that meets every week, and they, oh, what was that? They read everything, and um, and that's been really helpful, too. Awesome. Well, now that now that you are 100% an author, what do you love most? What do you love most about being an author? What do I love most about being an author? Yes. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know what? I love that I don't have to go into an actual office. Well, I have a home office, but um, I love that my commute is to walk downstairs and make myself sit at my computer. Uh, or that, I, I mean, I love the flexibility. I do. Uh, I've got three kids in elementary school, so I need to be able to be flexible. But, I mean, mostly I love, I love telling stories. I love meeting other creative people on a regular basis and and working with them because it's very inspiring. Um, I did, Like I said, I worked in textbook publishing, and it's not. I, I met some really interesting people. I worked with people like Tommy DePaula, um, you know, the Streganona books and stuff. And it, that's always kind of fun. Uh, but at the same time, there's just something about the the hierarchical structure of. I don't know. I just can't play office politics. I don't. 
I don't do that well. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yeah, I, there's I can't, definitely some freedom in being an author. Yeah, and just, I can't fake it. Yeah. Well, I have Asperger's. <laughs> let me let me be honest. I my filter is very um, questionable. <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> tell. When, I can't tell when people are joking, like or you know, and I can't always disguise it when when somebody's disgusted me, and, and so it's it's hard to be in an office full of people where I'm supposed to be, be behaving, quote unquote, and I don't know how to behave. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Well, cool. Amanda, thank you so much for being our special guest today. Uh, we will have a link to your book in the show notes for this episode, and our listeners can find that at shewroteabook.com slash the number seven to learn more about our author and her lovely book. Thanks again, Amanda. It's been thank great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to She Wrote a Book. If you enjoyed this episode, then subscribe now so you can automatically get access to all new episodes and feel free to share your inspired thoughts with us in the comments too. I'd love to hear from you. Are you ready to write your own book? Get started now with my quick and concise webinars so you can learn my insider secrets on writing and publishing your own book. Claim your free gift now at shewroteabook.com slash bonus. Until then, may you always feel good and make magic. Feel good, make magic now. Lena and Nani will show you how. Ignite that wisdom inside of you. And show the world what you do. To publish, write, and promote. Learn the best way to go.